Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on uh, biosimilar biologics in the USA approval pathway. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'll be your host for today's session. And on behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all for being part of today's session. Uh, today's webinar is being presented by Mr. Albert Guignelm. Uh Before we start off today's session, ladies and gentlemen, a few words about Albert. Uh, Albert's the CEO of AAG Incorporated, and for more than 30 years, his focus has been on FDA-related matters in regulatory affairs, quality assurance, and clinical affairs. And he also has expertise in dealing with all aspects of the FDA approval process for drugs, biologics, medical devices, and generic drugs. And he's also worked in every major segment of the industry research, quality assurance, regulatory affairs, manufacturing, and also clinical. And he's responsible for regulatory submissions, registrations, FDA liaison, clinical studies, compliance activities, and also FDA training. And Albert also has expertise in the assessment of product and facilities for due diligence relative to FDA requirements. And he lectures throughout the world on numerous FDA-related matters. And he also consults to FDA and also trains FDA field force. In addition, also to training FDA personnel, he consults and trains for drug, biologic, and medical device companies, U.S. Army HIV Research Group, NIH AIDS Group, U.S. Army Surgical Research Group, and also the Naval Medical Research Group. And Albert is a member of the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society, which elected him in the year 1984 as Professional of the Year. And he's also served as the Society as the Vice President, President, and also Chairman of the Board of Directors. And also he numerous in recent years, he's filed numerous FDA drug, biologic, and also medical device submissions for product approval. And he's also been involved in two of the largest clinical trials conducted, the 8,000 patient clinical trials in Africa, and also the 16,000 patient clinical trials in Thailand. And we're honored to have Albert with us today to present today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start off today's session, I just want to quickly outline today's program. This webinar is for a 90-minute duration. First. Albert will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas he would cover, and then share with you his presentation. And also would like to inform all our attendees present that once part of today's teleconference, you've been placed on mute and would remain so until the Q&A begins. You have over 10 minutes at the end for your question and answers. And during the session, ladies and gentlemen, if you do come up with questions or answers, you can post them in the Q&A panel or the chat column as well. And for any reason, ladies and gentlemen, if you do get logged out of today's session, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we're all ready, I request Albert to take it from you. Albert? Thank you, Michael. I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, particular session on biosimilar biologics in the United States. Um, we have uh, a tremendous amount of material to cover in 90 minutes. Um, I decided when I put this presentation together rather to give you more information rather than less. Um, you will get obviously a copy of this, so um, you will have all this information to uh, peruse later on. These are the guidelines so far that FDA has issued for biosimilar biologic products, uh, quality considerations in demonstrating biosimilarity, to a reference protein, that's the already licensed protein product on the market, scientific considerations in demonstrating biosimilarities of the same reference product, and of course there's a, a Q&A um, session that FDA also put out. We certainly will talk about these things, but there's many other things that we'll talk about during our uh, presentation here. Let's start off with the Biologics Prize Competition and Innovative Act, Innovation Act. And that was part of the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, that President Obama signed into law in March 2010. This, um, similar to what they have done with generic drugs, created an abbreviated licensure pathway for biologic products shown to be biosimilar to or interchangeable with an FDA-licensed reference product. Now, um, in a short period of time, I will define biosimilar and interchangeable. As far as FDA is concerned, uh, until the first few biosimilar products are placed on the marketplace, we will not be looking at interchangeable products. 
um, <coughs> FDA is going to con um, concentrate initially on biosimilarity. Um, so one of the things I can tell you with this uh, generic process versus the drug one, the one with biologics is a bit more complicated um, than the one we have for um, chemical synthetic drugs. The Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act is the major law uh, under which FDA has, and as part of that, we have the abbreviated new drug application process in Section 505. 505 is the new drug section of um, the uh, act. It was established through the 1984 Hatch-Waxman Amendments, thus creating generic drug program for small molecules. Uh, obviously, this was a model which they used uh, when they were thinking about um, biologic generic products. The BPCI, that's that Biologic Price Competition Innovation Act, uh, was enacted as part of this Obamacare on March 2010. Uh, the act creates an abbreviated licensure pathway for biologic products shown to be biosimilar to or interchangeable with an FDA-licensed biologic reference product. That is the product which FDA has already uh, put on the marketplace. Now, biologics in the United States, I don't know any of your backgrounds, so I tend to define things a lot more. I apologize if I'm talking to you about things you already know, but I, I can't take the chance that there's someone out uh, there in the group that doesn't know these things. I'd rather cover them than not. Um, biologics in the United States are a subset of drugs. If you ask the question, how are biologics products regulated in the United States, they are regulated as drug products. They are a special subset of drugs. They, compared to chemical synthetics, are licensed. Um, under the Public Health Service Act. Um, chemical synthetic uh, drugs are just approved. Biologics are licensed. Now, I, I, as far as biologics go, I use the term licensed and approved interchangeably, so if you hear me say either or, you know exactly what I mean. The objectives of the act are conceptually similar to those of the drug uh, generic process, which established the abbreviated pathway for the approval of drug products under the Food and Drug Act. The implementation of abbreviated licensure pathway for biologics products certainly has change, uh, challenges, much more so than the chemical synthetic process for traditional drugs, given the scientific and technical complexities that may be associated with the larger and typically more complex structure uh, of the biologic product, products. Um, my contention always has been one of the major difference between chemical synthetics and biologics our manufacturing process. Much more complicated for a biologic product than for a chemical synthetic product. Most biologic products are produced in a living system, such as a microorganism, a plant, animal cell, whereas small molecule drugs are typically manufactured through chemical synthesis. Um, just a knowledge check. We really, uh, with the 90 minutes, don't have time to go through this, but the BPCI Act creates what? The answer is A. Um, abbreviated biologic license pathway, which we haven't defined yet, but we will very shortly. Biologics products are generally produced using a living system or organism, and they may be manufactured through biotechnology or derived from natural sources or produced synthetically. I was part owner of a biotech company, um, and uh, we brought some of the first proteins to the U.S. market. We set up with uh, the Biologic Center, the Biologic Approval Pathway, which you people follow today. Um, and uh, the first product, uh, biologic protein, that we brought to, to Mark was alpha interferon. Biologic products in the Public Health Service Act now include the term protein. The definition has been changed now with the result with this uh, amendment under the um, Public Health Service Act. Now, biologic is a virus, therapeutic serum, toxin, antitoxin, vaccine, blood, blood component, or derivative allergenic product, protein, except any chemical synthetic, synthesized polypeptide or analogous product for the prevention, treatment, or cure of diseases and condition of man. Um, so, as you can see, this uh, biologic definition has been altered slightly by adding the term protein. Historically, some proteins have been approved as drugs under Section 505 of the Food and Drug Act, and other proteins have been licensed as biologics under 351. At one time, um, that was a problem 
um, in the sense that the, it wasn't well defined today. It is, is extremely well defined. Um, the drug center does have their own biologic group, and of course the biologic center. The drug center has the, the more well-established um, proteins uh, that they uh, regulate, whereas when you talk about the biologic center, uh, they're much more cutting edge. Under the BPCI Act, a protein, except any chemical synthesized polypeptide, will be regulated as a biologic product. Now, Section 351K was the section of the Public Health Service Act added by the BPCI Act that sets forth the requirements allowing for a biosimilar product. Um, first of all, for a biosimilar product, and then for a proposed interchangeable product. Um, biosimilarity, as the definition is, can mean that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference products. That's the already licensed product on the marketplace notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components, and that there are no clinically meaningful differences between um, the biologic product, your biosimilar product, and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. A 351K application must contain, among other things, information demonstrating that the biologic product is biosimilar to the reference product based on data derived from uh, in vitro studies, analytical studies, animal studies, that's in vivo studies in the biologic system, and a clinical study or studies, and FDA will, along with you, determine how many studies you need clinically um, in, um, during your negotiations with FDA as your product goes through the biosimilar process. To meet the higher standards of interchangeably, interchangeability, which FDA is not accepting right now. <coughs> Excuse me. The only thing FDA is, is accepting right now are products for biosimilarity. Uh, to meet the higher standards of interchangeability, an applicant must provide sufficient information to demonstrate biosimilarity and also to demonstrate the biologic product can be expected to produce the same clinical result as a reference product in any given patient. And if this biologic product is administered more than once, the risk in terms of safety or diminished efficacy of switching back and forth between the two products, that is your biosimilar and the reference product, is not greater than the risk of using the reference product without such switches. So when we talk about biosimilarity, we're talking about a product that's essentially the same as the reference product. And when you use it clinically, you, it's assuming it becomes a marketed product, you use it clinically, you use it on a patient, you would use your product, your biosimilar product, constantly for that patient. What they're talking about with interchangeability is the following. They're saying to you, well, I can start using your product, and then I can switch to the reference drug, and then I can switch back to your product, and then clinically there is no significant difference. Now, obviously, if you want that kind of claim, you're going to have to do additional clinical work basically to demonstrate to FDA that your product's truly interchangeable. And as I said, FDA right now is not accepting anything like that. They still haven't approved the bio, uh, biosimilar product, and that is the first thing on their agenda. The BPCI Act also includes, among other provisions, exclusivity periods, uh, a 12-year exclusivity period from the date of first licensure of the reference product. Talking about the reference product, doing its approval of a 351K application reference it, and that product may not be made. So you get your innovative product license. This is the reference product in this case. Um, you will have a 12-year exclusivity period. Near the end of that 12-year exclusivity period, FDA will then call for applications for biosimilar products. A four-year exclusivity period from the date of first licensure of the reference product during which a 351K application referencing that product may not be submitted. So what happens here, um, what we're talking about um, is with the biosimilar product that you're going to have this exclusivity uh, period from the, dirt, uh, from the date of first licensure. An exclusivity period for the first biologic product determined to be interchangeable with a reference product for any condition of use during which a second or subsequent biologic product may not be determined interchangeable with that reference product. 
So um, certainly what they're talking about here is the interchangeability, interchangeability uh, which FDA is not addressing currently. An exclusivity period for certain biologic products which pediatric studies are conducted in accordance with a written request, you can indeed get an extra, an extra exclusivity period for any pe pediatric indication you would get. Uh, remember, we do have on the books a pediatric law which says if your product is pertinent for use in pediatric uh, work, you are required legally to eventually uh, uh, to do that study um, to do, try to get the in pedi pediatric claim. A 351K application, remember that's the application for a biosimilar product, must include information demonstrating that the biologic product is biosimilar to the reference product that is biosimilar based on your in vitro work, your analytical work, based on your animal studies, and based on whatever clinical work FDA requires. Utilizing the same mechanism acting for the proposed condition of use, only to the extent known for the reference product. And as you know, there are many products we certainly to date still don't know um, adequately what the mechanism of action is. Uh, the condition of use proposed in the labeling have been previously approved for the reference product and you will also have the same uh, labeling, and you will have, compared to the reference product, the same route of administration, the same dosage form, and the same strength as the reference product. This is slightly different than what we have for the generic drug product, but this is certainly more stringent than, than what they have for generic chemical synthetic drugs. Um, definition of a biologic product has changed by adding what word, and the answer is B. Uh, protein, which we um, covered just a few minutes ago. Now, moving along at quite a, a, a fast clip, um, reason being I have so much information in here, uh, I want to cover it with you within this 90 minute, minute time frame. But don't forget along the way, um, if you do have questions, well, you can either put them in the chat box or you can wait till the end. At the end of the presentation, we do have a Q&A session. Biosimilar or biosimilarity means that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences, notice what it says here, in clinically inactive components. And there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biologic product and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. And this is basically based on the clinical, but that also throws in the animal work and the analytical work um, that you've done. Uh, now, this is the general uh, requirements for biosimilarity. A 351K application must include information demonstrating biosimilarity based on data derived from, first of all, analytical studies. Demonstrating that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding these minor differences. And, of course, a lot of this is uh, as you characterize your product. Animal studies, and this also would include toxicity studies. A clinical study or studies, including the assessment of immunogenicity and pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics that are sufficient to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency in one or more appropriate conditions of use where the reference product is licensed. And you will find out um, as we move through this presentation that FDA will discuss with you prior to doing any clinical studies what type of clinical study they want you to run and how many clinical studies they want you to know. So this is going to be negotiable uh, with FDA. FDA may determine in its discretion that an element described above is unnecessary, uh, and of course that will also be uh, with the correspondence with FDA um, that you have. How close do the proposed biosimilar products compare to the reference products? Advances in our current analytical methods enhance the likelihood that a product will be highly similar to another product by better targeting uh, the original product's physiochemical and functional properties. And of course, um, during our analytical work, during our characterization, uh, we're certainly going <clears> to <throat> do uh, many of these things um, to show that our product is um, extremely close, similar um, to the reference product. Interchangeability, the biologic product is biosimilar to the reference product. 
it can be expected to produce the same clinical result as the reference product in any given patient. And of course, this takes into account switching from your product to the reference product and back and forth. Whereas when we talk about biosimilarity, that does not take that into account. If you're uh, licensed as a biosimilar product, uh, the intent is for the patient, whoever's using your patient, to use only your product and not interchange with the reference product. For a product administered more than once, the safety and reduced efficacy risks of alternating or switching are not greater than that with repeated use of the reference product. So therefore, um, in the, the additional clinical work you, you would do, and you will do additional clinical work, eventually when FDA accepts um, applications for interchangeability, you will do studies there to demonstrate uh, that if you switch back and forth between the two products, the reference product and your product, um, it has no um, clinically meaningful um, effects, negative effects uh, on the patient. Note, the interchangeable product may be substituted for a reference product without the authorization of the healthcare provider. And of course, as I've said a number of times already, we aren't there yet with FDA. Um, so um, certainly uh, FDA is first working on biosimilarity. The development programs um, include prospective development programs, global programs, retrospective development programs on data that's already been generated, and programs seeking licensure in the U.S. for similar biologic products licensed outside the U.S. So, uh, and there are. The Europeans have indeed licensed um, generic biologics already. Um, so um, they are indeed ahead of us in that, in that aspect. Uh, but FDA is looking very closely at some of the problems they're having um, and making sure or trying to make sure that we don't encounter the same problems. What about the development here? Uh, certainly reflects the public input and questions received by the agency at regulatory meetings, and most of those um, questions came from industry people. Initial draft guidance targeted to the highest priority issues and directed to clarifying expectations and trying to provide predictability to sponsors that are looking at developing biosimilar products. Now, what is the initial scope here in the development process? Characterization of the proposed biosimilar product and the reference product. Major point. Um, and of course, uh, from this characterization, uh, one can see how um, closely one is aligned to the reference product. Data needed such as PKPD, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, preclinical, clinical, um, certainly all of this uh, will be done, and we'll talk about these as we go on. And certainly um, there are also certain um, questions um, the FDA has answered in the guidance documents. Now, what is the scientific considerations? What is the totality of evidence approach? Um, this describes a stepwise approach to evidence development ensuring that development includes only those elements necessary to address residual uncertainty. So what FDA is talking about when they're talking about stepwise approach and totality of the evidence, the stepwise approach is we look at our proposed biosimilar product first analytically, then in vivo and in animal, in animal models, and then eventually in the human clinical models. So that is what FDA calls the stepwise approach. The totality of evidence is taking a look at all this data, albeit the analytical data, albeit the animal data, albeit the human data, and making a final judgment based on the totality of all that evidence. Introduces the concept that only after a thorough review of data from structural and functional analysis can FDA provide meaningful advice on scope and extent of necessary animal and human testing. FDA is saying here, and uh, nothing really different than what they're doing now for all their other products, is that we're going to look at the data, and based on the data, we're going to discuss with you, um, the company, uh, what animal and human testing uh, we feel you should do. Now, just um, an aside here for a second. Um, you will, as part of this process, have meetings with FDA. Conference calls are considered meetings. So will be the conference call, will be the face-to-face -face meeting with FDA. Um, you will have these meetings uh, with FDA. Never go into FDA with empty hands. 
In other words, don't go in with FDA to FDA and say, well, what do you want us to do, FDA? First of all, it annoys them. And second of all, they'll tell you to do everything under the sun. Um, when you go into FDA to discuss um, all these matters, come with your scientific plan. Come with the data you've generated, the analysis of the data, and what you're telling FDA is, FDA, this is what we plan to do. We'd like your comments on it. Much better approach. FDA would appreciate it, too. Explains um, the, the scientific consideration guidance. Explains general expectations for human clinical trials. At least one study will be expected. Um, and as I said, I can't, and this is just for biosimilarity. We're not talking about interchangeability here. Um, and uh, FDA and you will discuss this uh, based on what the situation for your product is. Um, maybe you have a product, a biosimilar product, that has never been uh, licensed or approved anywhere. Uh, or you might have one that maybe has already been uh, approved in Europe. The situation's going to be different. Uh, in one case where you already have an approval in, a, in another region, um, you probably have done additional work to establish that. Um, so the amount of work that you're going to have to do to satisfy FDA will vary depending on what uh, background information you have. You will do comparative safety and effectiveness data may be necessary if residuals uncertainties exist. Uh, and, of course, when you talk about safety and effectiveness, you're talking about much larger, more comprehensive clinical trials. FDA traditionally relies on uh, integrating various kinds of evidence in making uh, regulatory decisions. And certainly a totality of the evidence approach can be applied to assessing biosimilars. And again, totality of the evidence, looking at all the analytical evidence, looking at all the animal data, looking at all the human data, and then based on that totality of evidence, making some kind of determination on your product. It is possible to exceed a current state-of-the-art analysis by evaluating more attributes and combination of attributes at greater sensitivities uh, with multiple different methods. Such fingerprint-like characterization may reduce further the scope and the extent of future animal and clinical studies. And this all goes back to the beginning to when we're talking about characterizing our product vis-a-vis -vis the reference product. To provide the best advice on the scope of any required animal and human studies, FDA should already have completed a thorough review of data from all your previous structural and functional analysis. So um, what they're trying to tell you in a nice way here is you'll do all this uh, analytical work first. You'll do the characterizations and so on. Um, and, of course, then uh, at that point, FDA will discuss with you any future studies you might have, albeit animal studies, albeit human studies. Uh, FDA at that point is in a position to sit down with you and discuss. And again, this is the point where I tell you when you discuss this with FDA that you come with your program in hand, basically saying based on what we've done, FDA, this is what we feel uh, should be the next steps. What about quality considerations that FDA is looking at? This focuses on analytical studies that may be relevant to assessing the similarity between a proposed biosimilar protein product and a reference product. <coughs> Excuse me. General principles, importance uh, certainly of um, the analytical uh, phase here, the first phase that we're going to encounter, extensive analytical, physiochemical, and biological characterization of your particular um, proposed biosimilar product. Certainly, uh, talk about manufacturing science and quality by design approaches that may uh, facilitate fingerprint-like analysis and identification of lots used in the various analysis for biosimilar determinations. And of course, um, first of all, we have to show um, that with these particular lots, they on an ongoing basis meet the same specifications. And of course, then those are the lots we would use for these various determinations um, that we're going to be making to demonstrate that our product is indeed biosimilar to whatever the reference product is. Uh, certainly a protein definition, any alpha amino polymer with a specific defined sequence that is greater than 40 amino acids in size, and um, chemically synthesized polypeptide definition 
namely alpha amino acid polymer that is one, made entirely by chemical synthesis, and there's less than 100 amino acids in size. So um, certainly um, you can um, look at these definitions um, to assist you as you move along. An application for a biologic product must be submitted under Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act. Remember, biologics are licensed under the Public Health Service Act. An application for a biologic product may be submitted under the Food and Drug Act through March 23, 2020, if the product is in a product class for which there is already an approved application under the Food and Drug Act. And that was under um, the original system that licensed biologics. Unless there is another biologic product licensed under Section 351A of the Public, Sa Public Health Service Act that can serve as its reference product, and FDA is the one that will make this determination for you. As of uh, March 2020, an application for a biologic product approved under Section 505, that's the new drug section of the Food and Drug Act, of the Food and Drug Act will be deemed a biologic license application licensed under Section 351 of the Public Health Service. As of this date, all the applications will go um, through this biologic process. Now, by the way, um, just for your edification, FDA is saying for a biosimilar product, you will have to go through the IND BLA process. IND, Investigational New Drug Application, that's where all the research is done. Um, so you will spend the majority of time under the IND. The BLA is nothing more than the, uh, the marketing application, biologic license application. No research is ever done under a BLA. All the research is done under um, the IND. Um, first of all, let me give you some definitions uh, as I go along here. What is an amendment? An amendment is an, uh, a change to a non-approved application. Amendment is a change to a non-approved application. Now, INDs are never approved. It's a passive system. INDs become effective. So therefore, since INDs are never approved, you make a change to an IND, it's always referred to as an amendment. BLAs are different, the marketing application. BLA, before it's approved, you make a change, it's an amendment, a change to a non-approved application. Once a BLA is approved, it becomes a supplement. Any change is a supplement. You're supplementing the approval. So those are the definitions by which FDA goes relative to chemical synthetic drugs and biologic drugs. <clears throat> Non-U.S. licensed comparative products, the Public Health Service, Service Act defines the reference product for a 351K application as a single biologic product licensed under Section 351A against which a biologic product is evaluated. And, of course, FDA makes that determination. FDA evaluated public comments, uh, whether comparative animal or clinical data with a non-U.S. licensed product may support a demonstration of biosimilarity to a U.S. licensed reference product. You're going to find out that certainly they, they will allow, FDA will allow use of such data. If so, what type of bridging data may be required? And again, this is all part of meeting with FDA and negotiations with FDA. The first interchangeable pro product, as I told you, uh, right now FDA is not considering interchangeability. But eventually it will happen. And the first bi biologic product to be licensed as interchangeable is granted a period of exclusivity, just as if you went for a pediatric indication and so, and so on. You always get periods of exclusivity for those things. During the exclusivity period, a subsequent biologic product relying on the same reference product cannot be licensed as interchangeable. So you will have that period. Exclusively, exclusivity calculus is based on date of approval, date of first commercial marketing, and patent litigation milestones. And of course, this you and FDA will talk about. The reference product, <clears throat> a 351K application may not be submitted until four years after the date of first licensure of the reference product. And a 351K application may not be approved, not submitted. No, the first one said submitted, may not be approved. And, of course, approved also means licensed until 12 years after the date of first licensure of the reference product. 
So if you're the first one on the marketplace, you get 12 years exclusivity, assuming you don't add anything on, such as pediatrics and so on. Now, once um, you uh, file a um, biosimilar application, um, certainly, and that uh, application gets approved, uh, four years um, exclusivity um, until the next uh, biosimilar product comes down the line. Pediatric study requirements. Under the Pediatric Research Equity Act, all applications for new active ingredients, new indications, and new dosage forms, new dosing regimens, or new routes of administration are required to contain a pediatric assessment to support dosing, safety, and effectiveness of this product for the claimed indication unless this requirement is waived. Now, um, the law in the United States currently says <coughs> if you uh, want to get a drug product approved, one of the assessments you have to do is to see if it's applicable for pediatric use. If it is applicable for pediatric use, you can do one of two things. You can either side by side um, with um, your adult approval, um, have an application and uh, go forth with that and get both approved at the same time. Or you can get the adult approval alone and the law says within six months of getting the adult approval, one then has to file a pediatric protocol with FDA. If one fails to file the pediatric protocol, FDA can withdraw the adult approval. Now, that's one of the things eventually you're going to have to look at with FDA is, is my product, whatever my biosimilar product is, applicable to pediatric use? And, of course, um, one of the leading indicators for that is the labeling for the reference product. For purposes of this uh, pediatric act, a biologic product determined to be biosimilar is considered to have a new active ingredient. Interchangeable is not considered to have a new active ingredient. FDA encourages applicants to submit plans for pediatric studies during the IND stage of product development. And, of course, again, this is one of the things you talk to FDA about you know, whether you want to do this concurrently. Remember, if you do it side by side with the adult, it's going to take you more time. There are going to be more studies. It's going to be more work involved. But when you do get the licensure or approval, you get both. Uh, or you may, um, you know, want to take the approach that you go adult first and then later on go pediatric. Biosimilar pathways comprised of, and it would be the IND BLA process. ANDA, by the way, is abbreviated new drug application. That is the process for the generic chemical synthetic drug. So let's look at some questions that FDA has talked about uh, relative to biosimilar type products. When should a sponsor request an initial meeting with FDA? And what data and information should a sponsor provide to FDA as background for a proposed biosimilar development program? Now, you're at a point now with this question is you haven't started um, on your development program for your biosimilar. Um, you may have done some minor work on it, um, or you may have already have a product that was uh, approved in another region of the world as a biosimilar, um, and now you come forth to meet with FDA. FDA recommends that sponsors of proposed biosimilar products request an initial meeting with the FDA at such time as a sponsor can provide a proposed plan for its biosimilar development program, manufacturing process information, and preliminary comparative analytical data with the reference product. That's the initial um, characterization work that you, you've been doing on your product versus the, the reference product. Um, and this is assuming right now that you know what the reference product is. In most cases, you will. Um, so um, FDA um, says for the initial meeting, just as I have said twice already, we want you to have a plan in hand. We want you to have some data that you generated. We want you to come to us and explain this is what we're going to do, FDA. Please comment on our plan. Can a proposed biosimilar product have a different formulation than the reference product. Yes, differences between the formulation of a proposed product and a reference product may be acceptable. Uh, and of course, you're going to demonstrate that this difference in formulation doesn't have any clinical manifestation. A 351K application must contain information demonstrating 
that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. And what they're considering here with the formulation is clinically inactive components. Uh, obviously, the active being, being the um, major component of consideration. Um, so, um, therefore, um, you're going to have to do some work to show that the difference in formulation um, did, did not impact negatively uh, on your proposed uh, biosimilar versus the reference product. Can a proposed biosimilar product have a delivery device or container closure system that is different from the reference product? Yes. Um, design considerations in the delivery device or container closure system used with the proposed biosimilar may be acceptable. Uh, it may be possible, for example, for an applicant to obtain licensure of a proposed biosimilar product in a pre-filled syringe or auto-injector type device. Um, but again, certainly uh, what you're going to be doing here uh, is doing um, analytical work, uh, doing stability work um, to demonstrate that these differences have no negative impact. Can an applicant obtain licensure of a proposed biosimilar product for fewer than all the routes of administration which an injectable reference product is licensed? FDA has deemed yes, that is possible. An applicant may obtain licensure of a proposed biosimilar product for fewer than all the routes of administration which an injectable reference product is licensed. So um, certainly um, if one has such a situation, uh, one can pick the route uh, that one initially wants to uh, market with. Can an applicant obtain licensure for a proposed biosimilar product for fewer than all presentations? And when we talk about presentations, strengths or delivery device or container closure system, which a reference product is licensed. And yes, FDA is allowing all these changes, again, all with the same um, note is that you have to demonstrate the change has not negatively impacted your product versus the reference product. Yes, an applicant is not required to obtain licensure for all presentations for which the reference product is licensed. However, if applicant seeks licensure for a particular indication or other conditions of use for which the reference product is licensed, and that indication or condition of use corresponds to a certain presentation of the reference product, um, the applicant may need to seek licensure for that uh, particular presentation. And, of course, this is all determined when one meets with FDA initially. Can an applicant obtain licensure of a proposed biosimilar product for fewer than all conditions of use for which the reference product is licensed? And, yes, a biosimilar applicant generally may obtain licensure for fewer than all conditions of use for which the reference product is licensed. <coughs> Excuse me. By the way, <clears throat> the reason a lot of these changes are allowable, remember FDA already has um, some experience with chemical synthetics uh, in the generic process. So um, they're using a lot of their experience they learned over the years there and bringing it forth here uh, for this biosimilar process. Can a sponsor use comparative animal or clinical data with a non-U.S. licensed product to support a demonstration that proposed product is biosimilar to the reference. Yes. Um, again, a sponsor may use, by the way, um, I'm, I neglected to define something here for you. I apologize. The term sponsor. The holder of an IND is referred to as a sponsor by FDA. You are sponsoring analytical work. You are sponsoring human studies. You are sponsoring animal studies. So you're referred to as a sponsor. When you get to the BLA, the marketing application, you're called an applicant. You're applying for marketing approval. So those are the two terms they use. Yes, a sponsor may use a non-U.S. licensed comparative product in certain studies to support a demonstration that the proposed biologic product is biosimilar to the U.S. licensed reference. Now, notice the contingency FDA has here. However, as a scientific matter, analytical studies and at least one clinical pharmacokinetic study and at least one pharmacodynamic study intended to support a demonstration of biosimilarity must include an adequate comparison of the proposed biosimilar to the U.S. product. So um, certainly you can use this um, non-U.S. licensed product um, data as supporting data. But in essence, what FDA is saying here is um, for the data which we'll use for licensure, um, one has to see a side-by-side -side comparison to the U.S. licensed product. 
is a clinical study to assess the potential of the biologic product to delay cardiac repolarization, QT study, as most of you would know it, or a drug-drug interaction study generally needed for licensure of a biosimilar product? And the answer here is no. In general, when you're talking about these biosimilar products, you may rely upon the reference product's clinical evaluation of QT interval prolong, uh, prolong, um, prolongation, wow, um, and, of course, drug-drug interactions, too. Um, this, again, is taken from the drug generic process where uh, the law allows that FDA use some of the innovative product uh, data in support of your application. Now, you'll never see this data because that's confidential to the innovator, but FDA can use it uh, in support of your application. The law does give them that uh, right. How long should sponsors retain reserve samples, biologic products used in comparative clinical, uh, PK and or PD studies? Uh, the requirements, and notice CFR 320 is a drug section, uh, 32038, 3063 for retention of reserve samples used in bioavailability and bioequivalent studies apply to applications submitted under Section 505, the New Drug Act of the Food and Drug Administration, uh, Food and Drug Act. However, FDA recommends that the sponsor of proposed biosimilar retain reserve samples in the same manner the same time period, at least five years. Uh, all FDA is saying here is um, we'd like you to, first of all, have reserve samples, and second of all, keep them five years in case later on we have to go back and do some additional work. Can an applicant extrapolate clinical data intended to support a demonstration of biosimilarity in one condition of use to support licensure of the proposed biosimilar product and one or more additional conditions of use? And again, it's a yes from FDA with the contingencies. If the proposed product meets the statutory requirements for licensure as a biosimilar product under the 351K uh, um, provision, um, data derived from a clinical study sufficient to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency in appropriate condition of use, the potential exists for a biosimilar product to be licensed, one or more additional conditions of use for which the reference product is licensed. Um, now, um, you're going to have to, again, FDA is telling you, you're going to have to prove to us scientifically that this is possible. Again, it always comes down to the same thing with FDA. They can say, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but you have to prove it to us first. Um, so they give you a lot of latitude here in saying yes, 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 but the contingency every time is prove it, prove it, prove it. And if you prove it, we will allow it. And if you don't approve it, we will not allow it. How can an applicant demonstrate that its proposed injectable, injectable biosimilar product has the same strength as the reference um, licensed product? Okay, an applicant must demonstrate that the strength of the proposed biosimilar product is the same as the reference product. As a scientific matter, there may be a need to take into account different factors and approaches in determining this um, strength determination. In general, we expect injectable biologic, biological products to have both the same total content of drug substance in whatever mass of units of activity in a container closure system and the same concentration of drug substance as the reference uh, product to have the same strength. <clears throat> and again, the contingency with a modified approach if you have a more complex product. Um, but FDA is saying the same thing over and over here. Um, yeah, we can consider these things, um, but you're going to have to demonstrate. What constitutes publicly available information regarding FDA's previous determination that the reference product is safe, pure, and potent um, to include in a, a 351K application? Um, when you talk about publicly available information, in this context generally includes type of information found in the action package for BLA. Um, action package is the package the chairman of the review committee uh, put together based on the um, each reviewer's um, evaluation package and, of course, their determination, um, the chairman's determination. Uh, the chairman is actually of the review committee that actually puts the action package together. Whether um, 
one should now, uh, first of all, it starts with the IND, whether one should be allowed to have an effective IND or be on clinical hold, and then, of course, with the BLA, whether one gets licensed or not. However, FDA notes that submission of a publicly available information composed of less than the action package for the reference product will generally not be considered a bar to submission or approval. Um, there is publicly available you know, information on FDA's webpage. Um, you can go there and you can look at these um, these um, action packages um, and um, basically see uh, what FDA required for the reference product uh, to be approved. Can an applicant obtain a determination of interchangeability between his proposed product and a reference product in an original? Well, the law allows that. FDA can make a determination of interchangeability in a 351K application or any supplement. Remember what I defined supplement. An interchangeable product must be shown to be biosimilar and meet the other standards, you know, that it can be used interchangeably within the same patient. Um, notice what they say now. At this time, it would be difficult as a scientific matter for a prospective biosimilar applicant to establish interchangeability in an original 351 application. So uh, what FDA is really trying to say here is what I've told you three or four times already. That is, when you go, if you wanted to go today to FDA and uh, get your biosimilar product license, they are not going to uh, license you for interchangeability. First, there'll be biosimilarity. Once they get a number of biosimilar products on the marketplace, then they will consider interchangeability but not until that time frame. Is a pediatric assessment under the Pediatric Act required for proposed uh, biosimilar um, product? All applicants, uh, all applications for new active ingredients, new indications, new dosage forms, and, and so on, are required to contain a pediatric assessment. And there is a form you fill out when you put uh, your IND application in, whether you're going to be um, required to do pediatric uh, studies or not. You all are required to do pediatric assessment. The assessment may show, well, this product is not applicable to the pediatric population. Or the assessment may show you are, and in that case, you're going to have to plan for those studies. So let's look at scientific considerations here, demonstrating biosimilarity to your licensed product. This is the, one of the guidances that FDA has put out. This guide gives an overview of FDA's approach to determine biosimilarity consistent with the long-standing agency approach to looking at scientific data. Remember, the term they use, totality of evidence, totality of evidence. They want you to do a stepwise approach, analytical first, animal second, human last, and then they want to look at all the data in totality of evidence. FDA intends to consider the totality of the evidence provided by a sponsor sponsor, the holder of the IND, and to support a demonstration of biosimilarity and recommends the sponsor use a stepwise approach in the development. And again, we define these terms, and I just covered them again for you. Um, the guidance discusses important scientific considerations in demonstrating biosimilarity. A stepwise approach to, a demonst to demonstrating biosimilarity, which can include a comparison of the proposed product and the reference product with respect to the analytical work, animal work, and human studies. And of course, um, much of this will be discussed with FDA at the various meetings you have with FDA as you go through the biosimilar development process. The totality of the evidence approach that FDA will use to review applications for biosimilar products, they will use this approach, which I defined a couple of times. General scientific principles in conducting comparative structural functional analysis, animal testing, human testing, um, all of this uh, is this combined. FDA will look at and provide us with a totality of evidence um, decision. An application submitted under Section 351K of the Public Health Service Act must contain, among other things, information demonstrating the biologic product is biosimilar to the reference based on data derived from analytical studies that demonstrate the biologic product is highly similar, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. And we showed that a couple of times already. 
animal studies, including the assessment of toxicity. And, of course, this is going to vary because um, some of your biologic products are going to be species-specific, um, so it's going to impact on how much you can do <coughs> Excuse me. in the animal world. And a clinical study or studies, including the assessment of immunogenicity and pharmacokinetics, that are sufficient to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency in the conditions of use for which you want to get licensed. So um, certainly um, all this information you already knew, um, but FDA is just stating it out front again uh, relative to their guideline. To obtain licensure of a proposed product under Section 351K of the Public Health Service Act, a sponsor must demonstrate the proposed product is biosimilar to a single reference product that previously has been licensed by FDA. And, of course, uh, if they've licensed more uh, than one of the same product, the FDA will tell you what the reference product is. In general, a sponsor needs to provide information to demonstrate biosimilarity based on data directly uh, comparing their product um, to the reference product. The stepwise approach, which we've talked about a few times, the purpose of a biosimilar development program is to support a demonstration of biosimilarity and assessment of the effects of any observed differences between the products, your product and the licensed product, but not to independently establish the safety and effectiveness of the proposed product. Um, safety and effectiveness will only come um, in that type of study if FDA feels it's necessary. If there are differences where FDA feels you have to do that type of study. Um, FDA recommends that the sponsor use a stepwise approach to developing the data and information to support uh, biosimilarity. At each step, the sponsor should evaluate the extent to which there is residual uncertainty about your product versus the licensed product and identify the next steps to try to assess that uncertainty. And if along the way you do have questions here or problems, that's the time you um, meet with FDA to discuss them. Where possible, studies conducted should be designed to maximize their con contribution to demonstrating biosimilarity. And again, um, this is the uh, stepwise approach, the analytical work, the animal work, the clinical work. <clears throat> Totality of evidence approach in evaluating a sponsor's um, demonstration of biosimilarity. FDA will consider the totality of the data and information submitted in the application, including uh, the analytical work, the non-clinical work, non-clinical meaning non-human studies. They usually refer to animal studies and human studies. And again, don't forget to keep saying when we talk about human studies, we're also talking about immunogenicity data. And they will define for you um, exactly to what extent you have to de um, demonstrate safety and effectiveness data. In most cases, you're not going to run full-blown safety and effectiveness studies. FDA intends to use a risk-based totality of the evidence approach to evaluate all of our um, data and information supported in uh, support of biosimilarity between your product and the reference product. The Public Health Service Act requires that the 351K application include information demonstrating biosimilarity based on data from analytical work, based on um, um, data from animals, and um, clinical work. Um, so derived from, among other things, analytical studies that demonstrate that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding the minor uh, differences. Unless FDA determines an element is unnecessary, they can, if they feel um, secure enough, they can eliminate work for you. FDA expects that a sponsor first will extensively characterize the proposed product and reference product with the state-of-the-art um, technology. Uh, extensive characterization of both products serves as the foundation for demonstrating biosimilarity. So, again, they're telling you take the stepwise approach. In general, FDA expects that the expression, um, the expression construct for the proposed product will encode the same primary amino acid sequence as the reference product. And, of course, um, during this characterization, these are the things that we demonstrate. However, minor modifications, such as N or C terminal truncations, that will not affect safety and effectiveness may be justified and should be explained. Again, 
you will, during your characterization, define how you're the same. And if there are differences, you hopefully demonstrate there are minor differences, and you will have to give a scientific justification why these minor differences have no impact on safety and effectiveness. Sponsors should use an appropriate analytical methodology with adequate sensitivity and specificity for the structural characterization uh, of the proteins. Uh, and what, what uh, they're going to include here is now some of the testing uh, that one uh, might do um, during this stage. And as you can see, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these things, but these are some of the things um, that FDA is suggesting. <clears throat> Sponsors conduct extensive um, structural uh, characterization in multiple representative lots. Notice what they said, multiple representative lots of the proposed product and the reference product to understand the lot-to-lot -lot variability of both drug substances in the manufacturing process. For those that do, you don't know definitions, a drug substance is the active, <clears throat> and that's all, that's all it means. Lots used for the analysis is put the biosimilarity of both the clinical material used in confirmatory clinical trials and the to-be-marketed proposed product. So what they're saying here is these lots that you're using for these analysis should be representative uh, lots in the sense that you would use for the clinicals and then um, certainly um, similar um, identical product to be used, uh, be marketed. Sponsors should justify the selection of the representative lots, including the number of lots. In addition, FDA recommends that sponsor analyze the finished dosage form of multiple lots of the proposed product and the reference product compared side by side, assessing all the excipients, the excipients being the non-active ingredients, and any formulation effect on purity, product, and process-related impurities and stability. And, uh, and of course, during characterization, um, you will determine the impurities. Um, you will um, determine uh, the impurity of the drug substance, the impurity profile. You will look at degradation uh, during stability studies. So all these things you will be doing um, and assessing um, this product versus the licensed product. The pharmacologic activity of protein products can be evaluated by in vitro and in vitro functional assays. These assays may include but are not limited to bioassays, biologic assays, binding assays, and enzyme, enzy enzyme kinetic assays. Um, certainly, it's going to be a functional evaluation comparing a proposed product to the reference product using these various um, types of testing. Animal toxicity testing, and again, this is going to vary depending on your protein product. As a scientific matter, animal toxicity data considered useful when based on results of extensive structurally and functional characterization. Uncertainties remain about the safety of the proposed product that need to be addressed before initiation of human studies. A nice way of saying this is we want to be as sure about our product as we are uh, before we get into humans for the safety of the human subjects. Animal toxicity studies are generally not useful if there is no animal species that can provide pharmacologic relevant data for the protein product. And I have mentioned that a couple of times, um, so one will have to make this determination. Of course, this will be part of the initial discussions with FDA. However, there may be some instances when animal data from a pharmacologically non-responsive species may be useful to support clinical studies. And of course, you and FDA will make this determination together. When animal toxicity studies are conducted, it will be generally useful um, to perform a comparative animal tox toxicology study with the proposed product and the reference product, comparative um, study. And the selection of dose, <coughs> regimen, du um, duration, and test species for these studies should be for, uh, provide a meaningful comparison. It is important to understand the limitations of such animal studies uh, when interpreting results. So uh, there's a bunch of considerations. They have small sample size, intraspecies variation, and that's true. But there are other considerations here, too, relative to the animal species that one uses. Clinical studies, which is really what FDA is going to base the final decision on the uh, 
um, approval or licensure of the biosimilar product. The sponsor of a proposed product must include in its submission to FDA information demonstrating there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biologic product and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. And FDA's position is the only place you can really demonstrate that adequately is in humans. In general, the clinical program must include a clinical study or studies. Notice FDA gives you that um, statement in that way because your discussions with them will determine whether it's one study or multiple studies. Sufficient to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency in one or more appropriate conditions of use which the reference product is licensed. So it depends on uh, whether you're going to duplicate the labeling of the licensed product or not. The OMPKPD studies comparing a proposed product to the reference product generally are fundamental components and supporting a demonstration of biosimilarity. And usually when you talk about PK and PD studies, um, in, in terms of um, chemical synthetics, they're phase one studies. Uh, in terms of uh, biologic products such as you have, um, this is um, more like a phase one slash two study. We have determined that both PK and PD studies, where there is a relevant pharmacodynamic measure, generally be expected to establish biosimilarity unless the sponsor can scientifically demonstrate otherwise. Again, FDA is saying, discuss with us, uh, and then we'll make a determination. For example, FDA recommends that to the extent possible, the sponsor select PD measures that are relevant to clinical outcomes. Um, MOA stands for mechanism of action. Um, can be assessed after a sufficient period of time after dosing and with appropriate precision and have the sensitivity to detect cleaningly, clinically meaningful differences between the two products. Uh, and again, anytime we get into this kind of, these kind of studies, you will have discussed this with FDA prior. It would be foolish not to do it that way. Because if you don't do it that way and you go ahead and do a study, FDA, after the fact, can say, well, nice study, good supporting data, but not the clinical study that we need, and whereby you would have to redo the study. So you don't want to be in that position. The goal of clinical immunogenicity uh, assessment is to evaluate potential differences between the two products in the incident and, and severity of human immune response. And with these proteins, you do get, um, in a good number of cases, um, a large um, percentage of people that have an immune response to the protein. Immune responses may affect both the safety and effectiveness of the product for, by example, altering PA, uh, PK, I'm sorry, and inducing anaphylaxis, which you hope they don't, because that could be turned into a tragic situation, or promoting uh, development of neutralizing antibodies. And the product's neutralized at this point. Um, so none of this is good, and, that, and that's why FDA wants to look, uh, have you look at immunogenicity. Um, as a scientific matter, it is expected that the following be assessed in clinical immunogenicity studies. Binding antibody, titer, specificity, relevant isotope, uh, isotype distribution, and, and so on. Neutralizing antibodies, if such exist, all of the above plus neutralizing uh, capacity to all relevant functions. So um, this is their main concern, um, and this will be part of your clinical program. As a scientific matter, comparative safety and effectiveness data will be necessary to support a demonstration of biosimilarity if there are residual uncertainties about the biosimilarity of the two products based on all the other data that you've generated. The sponsor may provide a scientific justification if it believes that some or all these comparisons on clinical safety and effectiveness are not necessary. Again, uh, full-blown safety and effectiveness studies, in most cases, you would not anticipate here. Uh, if you talk about the, the drug world uh, with generics, um, they do a bioavailability study, which is basically a phase one PK study, um, and, you know, based on that determination, determine bioequivalence. 
Here, um, it's a little more comprehensive, and here it's a little more complicated uh, because of the type of products we're dealing with. But in essence, what you're doing is these earlier phase type studies, unless FDA feels it's necessary, you do a full-blown safety and effectiveness study because there are differences, and the only way they're going to show these differences don't impact safety and effectiveness is do this human clinical trial. Clinical studies should be designed such that they can demonstrate that the proposed product has neither decreased nor increased activity compared to the reference product. Decreased activity would normally would ordinarily would preclude licensure of the product. Increased activity might be associated with more adverse effects or might suggest that the proposed product should be treated as a different product altogether. Um, and there you would have to get, uh, you would get licensure of an innovative product under those circumstances. A study um, employing a two-sided test in which the null hypothesis is that neither now, the null hypothesis, uh, let me just stop here. We're talking about statistics here. When you talk about null hypothesis, uh, what you're basically saying is, um, you know, you can't demonstrate any difference between these two products. What you do when you do studies is you try to, normally, you try to de disprove the null hypothesis. You're trying to say your product is better than the other product. In this case, we're not trying to say that. Um, the proposed product is inferior to the reference product, and the proposed product is superior. Inferior would be inferiority study. Superior would be superiority study. What, you're, what, you, what they're saying here is we want the, the null hypothesis to be true in this case. We want no difference between these two. We want them to be the same um, and demonstrate biosimilarity in this manner. Totality of the evidence means FDA reviews all data uh, prior to um, licensing your product. And let's look at some quality considerations um, as we're getting now near the end of our presentation here. Uh, we're running out of time, so um, let's move along. Advances in analytical sciences enable some protein products to be characterized extensively in terms of their physical, chemical, and biological properties. And of course, this is what FDA is expecting you to do. These analytical procedures have improved the ability to identify and characterize not only the product, but also product-related substances and product and process-related impurities. And of course, that's all part of this characterization process. Advances in manufacturing science and production methods may enhance the likelihood that a product will be highly similar to another product by better targeting the or original products, the licensed products, physiochemical and functional properties. And we talked a little bit about this um, a number of slides back. Factors for in consideration for assessing whether products are highly similar. The manufacturer should consider a number of factors. And let's look at some of the factors. Um, the expression system. Therapeutic protein products can be produced by microbial cells, cell lines of human or animal origin, or tissues derived from animals or plants. It is expected the impress expression construct for a biosimilar will encode the same primary amino acid sequence as the reference product. Minor modifications in N or C terminal truncations, uh, FDA uh, fields will not have an effect on safety, purity, and potency, and you may well justify those based on the studies that you've done. A comprehensive understanding of all steps um, in the manufacturing uh, process for the proposed biosimilar products should be established during product development. Characterization tests, process controls, specifications that will emerge from information gained during process development must be specific for the proposed biosimilar product and manufacturing process. Use of quality by design approaches uh, along with quality risk management and effective Quality systems will facilitate all this. Don't forget, folks, uh, as part of, the, part of validating this uh, manufacturing process, uh, FDA is going to expect the etiologic agent validation uh, that will demonstrate uh, that this particular system can remove contaminants, that contaminants exist um, to a certain, uh, I think it's um, six logs. And don't, don't hold me on that one. 
and of course um, you may also then uh, either entirely eliminate or reduce what the contaminants are to a, to an acceptable level. Um, assessment of physiochemical properties. Uh, physiochemical assessment of the proposed biosimilar product and the reference products consider all relevant characterizations of the protein product. And of course, FDA mentions some here. The objective of this assessment is to maximize the potential for looking for differences between your product and the reference product. Tests used to characterize the product do not necessarily need to be validated for routine quality control purposes, but should be scientifically sound, fit for their intended use, and provide results that are reproducible. In selecting these tests, it's important to consider the characterizations of the protein product, <coughs> including known impurities. Information regarding the ability of a method to discern differences uh, between your product and a reference should be submitted as part of the comparison. Tests chosen to detect and characterize these post-translational protein modifications will be demonstrated to be of appropriate sensitivity and specificity to provide meaningful information. And again, to show that both products are highly similar. Functional assays serve multiple purposes in the characterization of our protein products. Um, these tests um, act to complement physiochemical analysis and are a quality measure of the function of the protein product. Now, what about these activities? Uh, depending on the structural complexity of the protein and available analytical technology, the physiochemical analysis may be unable to confirm the integrity of the higher order structures. Instead, um, the integrity of such structures can be inferred from the product's biologic activity. Uh, and of course, these are the things that one would discuss uh, with FDA at the meetings um, that one will have uh, with FDA. The assessment of functional activities is also useful in providing an estimate of the specific activity of a product as an indicator of manufacturing process consistency. And of course, that will lead to power purity and stability. Um, FDA again goes into other type of testing receptor binding and immunochemical properties. When binding or immunochemical properties are part of the activity attributed to the protein, analytical tests should be performed to characterize the product in these particular terms. Various methods such as surface plasma uh, resonance, microcalorimity, or classical Classical analysis can provide information on the kinetics and thermodynamics of binding. And of course, FDA again uh, wants um, certainly uh, this information um, and the functional activity and characterization of the proposed uh, product's higher order structure. What about impurities? The applicant should characterize, identify, and quantify impurities in the proposed biosimilar product and the reference product. <coughs> In these comparative analysis reveals uh, comparable product-related impurities at similar levels between the two products. Um, certainly, you have uh, testing to characterize potential biologic effects of the specific impurities. Um, they may not be necessary under those conditions. However, if the manufacturing process used to produce the pr proposed biosimilar introduces different impurities, which it may, because your manufacturing process may not be identical to, probably won't be identical to the reference product. Uh, you may have different impurities, different levels of impurities. Um, then these additional studies uh, may be necessary to demonstrate um, that your product still is biosimilar. It's still acceptable to be biosimilar. Process-related impurities arising from cell substrates, cell culture components, if you use antibiotics and downstream processing steps, um, certainly should be evaluated. The potential impact of differences in the impurity profile upon safety should be addressed and supported by the appropriate data. And impurity is um, extremely important. Uh, the major cause of adverse events in humans and and we establish from clinical studies is impurities uh, associated with this uh, protein product. In all cases, the chosen analytical procedure should be adequate to detect 
identify and accurately quantify biologically significant levels of impurity. So FDA is going to spend a lot of time discussing this with you um, and doing this comparison vis-a-vis -vis the reference product. The safety of the proposed biosimilar product, as with any other biologic product, with regard to adventitious agents or endogenous viral contamination, should be ensured by screening critical raw materials and confirmation of robust virus rem material, uh, virus removal and inactivation, and this is what I call the etiologic agent validation, where your manufacturing process is shown to remove certain viruses, inactivate, reduce levels, whatever. Um, certainly FDA will require that. Reference product and standards, uh, thorough physiochemical and biological assessment of the reference product um, should provide a base of information on which to develop the proposed biosimilar product and justify reliance on the information, the scientific information already established about the reference product. <clears throat> and based on this and based on the work you've done, you should have sufficient evidence that the proposed biosimilar product is highly similar to the reference product. Uh, so certainly um, that is what FDA is seeking from you. The finished drug product, remember biologics are considered drugs. Product characterization studies should be formed on the most downstream, intermediate, best suited for the analytical procedures used. The attributes evaluated should be stable through any further processing step. For these reasons, characterization studies are often performed on bulk drug substance. Um, However, if you get reformulation or exposed to new materials in the finished dosage form, the impact of these changes also have to be considered. An appropriate physiochemical and functional comparison of the stability of the two products, uh, the reference product versus your biosimilar product. Uh, when you do stability, you're always required to do it at two temperatures. Um, the normal storage condition and, of course, what they call an accelerator or stress uh, test, which is a higher temperature, where you would force degradation, and you can look at degradation pathway, degradation product, um, and so on. So um, certainly, depending on the product you have, your stability might encompass more um, than just what I just mentioned. Um, you might have, uh, if you have... Um, a uh, lifelized product, you might have freeze-thaw type situation. Uh, light might affect your product and so on. So um, one not only will do this uh, type of stability, there is something else that FDA hasn't mentioned here in this guidance, uh, which I'll just throw in right now, and that is shipping studies. A shipping study is a two-part study. The first part takes your product, package it like you're going to ship it, and then put it on a shaker table, and your engineers will shake it and put it in all different positions. And they will establish that the packaging protects the product physically. And then they will put it in an oven, and an oven has special software associated with it. And they will now vary temperatures, humidities, and so on to demonstrate that packaging can protect the product environmentally. What is the um, essence here why FDA is interested in these type of studies? They want to make sure that when you ship your product, wherever it's going, whether it's east coast to west coast, whether it's going out of the country, when the product arrives at its def destination, that it's still within specification. And that's what they're concerned about. Biosimilar product fees. There's a fee for the biosimilar development program. There's an annual biosimilar product development fee, which you'll pay. Um, if you discontinue and then reactivate, you'll pay another fee. Then when you file the application, um, certainly um, there's a fee, which last time I looked, oh, don't hold me to this number, I believe it's around $2 million. And, uh, of course, there's an annual fee for your manufacturing facilities. Whether they are in the U.S. or not, if you, this facility makes product for the U.S., they have an annual fee. FDA has published how many biosimilar guidelines? And the answer is D3. All right. Um, I apologize for having to move so quickly, uh, but even moving quickly, I'm over time here. So for the last few minutes uh, that we have here, uh, I will take any questions that you may have. 
uh, relative to the things that we talked about here, uh, relative to biosimilar products. Michael, um, they can either send, uh, they can type the question in here, or um, can they raise their hand? Uh, absolutely, uh, Albert. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, like Albert just said, uh, this would be a time. If you want to directly put forward any verbal questions for Albert, what you could do is you could click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon on your participant screen. Uh, that way I can go ahead and unmute your individual lines and you can directly put forward your questions for Albert. Or you can make use of the Q&A option or the chat messenger to send in your questions. So if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, please go ahead. Uh, this would be a time. And okay. just want to remind you all as well that, uh, I'm sorry, Albert, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you think of questions after the fact, um, you can send them to Michael. He'll, he will forward them to me. Uh, and I'll be glad to respond to them. Uh, let's say you think about something tomorrow. So there's no problem. Uh, you can work through Michael on that. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you so much, Albert. Yep, uh, Albert is just going to say the same thing, ladies and gentlemen. If you do come up with questions at any time after today's session, you can uh, send any questions over to us as well, and we'll make sure these questions are forwarded to our speaker to get you your answers. And at the same time, I just want to remind you all as well that uh, Today's webinar is available in a recorded format, so if you feel that today's web webinar will be beneficial for any of your colleagues or friends or anybody else in your organization, you can uh, have them log on to our website at globalcompliancepanel.com or you can uh, give us a call as well and make a purchase online. Uh, Albert, I don't see any questions coming up. Okay. I'll just give it final I'll, 10 seconds to see if you do have any questions. Me, Michael. Uh, I want to thank the group for joining me. And don't forget, if you do have questions after the fact, um, contact Michael, and he will make sure that uh, I get to answer your questions. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if any questions come up, I'll make sure these are forwarded to our speaker to get you your answers. And at the same time, uh, I would like to advise you that the feedback form for today's session is open in the polling area. So please do go ahead and share your feedback on today's session. We have just over eight questions, and they are all multiple choice in nature, so it shouldn't take you more than a couple of seconds before you log off to uh, go ahead and answer the question. We really appreciate your feedback. This will only help us in uh, making our webinars better as we go along. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for participating in today's webinar, and on behalf of our speaker, Mr. Albert Guignon, and the entire Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all, and I hope the rest of the day is a lovely one. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.